thank you for being with us today. Um, we are shooting the uh, third episode of our series of open data in construction in the UK construction industry. This is a project funded by B the BRE Trust in collaboration with uh, Constructing Excellence G4C. Mm -hmm. um, and the Open Data Institute is also helping us uh, find the interesting people to talk to. Uh, we have here today um, Stephen Baldrich from Barrett Homes um, and Ben Cave, uh, Citadel on the Move, and we talk about housing. So why is housing important? That is kind of self-evident, really. Um, we all need housing. You know, in an Article 25 um, of the Human uh, Rights um, uh, Declaration, uh, next to uh, food and clothing, housing is the third thing we all need all across the, the world. Um, and we are trying in the UK to supply the housing we need, uh, but population is, is increasing quite rapidly, um, and we sometimes fear we're not going to be able to meet that demand. Um, you know, we want to get into the problem of housing, explaining um, people uh, following this series uh, what the issue is, um, and at the same time want to get into open data and understand what open data is and how open data may provide interesting solutions um, to that problem. So I would like to, you know, uh, start from Stephen, um, and and as I said, just you know, let's try to break down what the issue is. You know, you know. Providing housing is a complex process. Um, it starts from land. Um, it has to go through planning. Um, it needs to move from design to construction. And after being constructed, it has to be sold and then maintained. So it's, it's an ongoing relationship with your customers, uh, isn't it? It is, yeah. yeah as you say, which, uh, which, which starts uh, right, right from the beginning of that process. You know, most of our customers are kind of live in the communities that we're building in. So as you say, right from that point, even through to selling and maintaining, they are involved in the process. So um, let's start from th from the very beginning. So um, Barrett is one of you know the biggest and most established um, housing developers in the UK. Um, I understand you develop all across uh, the country, mm -hmm. um, and I suppose the beginning of your game starts with a plot of land. I is that how it works? It, it, it exactly that. Yeah. So kind of our land, you know, it, it it can broadly be split into kind of two streams as to where it's sourced from. So we have the kind of the more uh, oven ready type of site, which is kind of, you know, within the local plan identified as, you know, being uh, uh, to, to be developed for housing. Um, and that kind of comes in typically kind of more small parcels and, and that's kind of um, brought to our attention through a combination of local knowledge and land agents that have kind of, you know, uh, knowledge of that and, and bring it to the table. And then we have kind of the more strategic sites, uh, which is kind of the new towns type approach, you know, much vast, faster parcels of land, um, which is our job to kind of, you know, there's, there's a lot more work kind of involved in that and kind of bringing that through uh, to kind of ultimately getting planning permission for housing. So what's the issue in finding land right now? What, what, what could be improved? Um, it's a good question. Uh, and, and being completely frank, I'm, I'm not the ideal person to answer that, uh, you know, that we've got you know uh, excellent land guys in all the divisions, and and, and it's probably a regional regional issue. Uh, being frank, um, and and you know you know the, the divisions that operate kind of in central London, you know, it's obviously going to mm. be constraints there, um, kind of you know outside that, and you know in, in the in the in the green belt, um, there's obviously you know constraints. There's obviously there's land there, um, but not kind of allocated for housing and protected. Um, but I, th I think there is there's, there's, a, there's a stream of land that, that comes through. Um, our land bank is, is healthy at the moment, uh, which is good. Um, but it, it, it's a challenge getting it through and, and, and then getting the planning uh, permission on it in kind of a, you know, a timely manner that you know, once the land's identified, actually then starting delivering homes from it can be a lengthy process. So is planning a collaboration process um, or, or rather um, less? Um, you know, fluid. So what, what are the hurdles for a better um, engagement with the planning and local authorities from your point of view? We firmly believe that planning is a collaborative process uh, and it's, it's collaborative with the, with the local authority uh, and with the local community. Uh, you know, we, uh, we do strong community engagement with every site that we're looking to develop. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we, you know the, the last thing that we'd want to do is kind of be seen to just kind of, you know, be bulldozing our way into communities. We want to deliver homes where people want those homes to be built. Um, so yeah, right, right from the outset, you know, we, we have strong relationships with you know, virtually all local authorities, you know, at this divisional level, 
um, and you know, uh, kind of by, by engaging them in the process early on, you know, does kind of streamline it as much as we can. But there's, there's obviously there's a time lag in the process, kind of inherently. Right, right. And so is is participation and engagement in local community um, something that we could, you know work on in a, in a better way. It, uh, have you noticed in, in the recent years an improvement in the way you engage with local community through, you know, I don't know, IT or...? A hundred percent there's been an improvement in the way that we that we engage. Um, more often than not it's in kind of the, you know, the, the tried and trusted manner of, you know, the, the local village hall uh, go and, you know, be open, honest, these are our intentions, this is what we're looking to do, this is how we've tried to kind of minimise the impact, this is how we've tried to integrate this new site with the existing community um, and that and that tends to be typically how we do it um, there are some instances where the use of technology has been has been taken advantage of but they're, they're few and far between being honest right mm -hmm. right so we we found a piece of land we went through the collaborative hopefully collaborative process of planning engage with the local community so we all know we want that new housing estate to be built um, and now we go on site what are the issues you're now facing on site? Um, what what we effectively do is, is by by bringing a kind of a site to a community is is we almost we, we start a, a temporary manufacturing facility in a you know a residential environment. Um, and so we have a lot of issues around kind of you know uh, making sure that the impact during construction is is minimised and that we're kind of you know a considerate neighbour during those those uh, those phases. Um, you know, our, our site managers are fantastic at kind of at liaising with the community and being kind of approachable, um, you know, and, and for the local community to feel able that they can come and say, you know, you know this isn't quite working for us kind of thing. Um, you know, so we do a lot of work on kind of restricting the times that, you know, deliveries can be made to site and things like that. Um, so to, from the community side, I'd say that they're the main issues that we face. Uh, and then obviously, you know, there's, there's many kind of technical issues and, you know, build issues that, you know, have to be faced throughout the process as well. And we went through um, a period of economic recession where uh, a huge amount of skills um, kind of left the industry. And, and as the economy is picking up again, we find that those people are not coming back. Uh, either they found uh, other jobs um, or we failed um, in retaining them. Um, so, you know, you would mentioning earlier you know we have a skills shortage mm -hmm. haven't we? We, we we do definitely um i mean it, it's you know we can we can kind of see the trends um in kind of you know the, the numbers of, of people that we employ you know through, through our subcontractors um and how many we need to deliver the, the number of homes that we want to be delivering as a, as a business so we're currently delivering around fifteen thousand homes a year we want to be delivering around twenty thousand by 2020 and the, and the serious concern that there's there's not the people out there needed to do that. So uh, as you say, there's, you know, people did leave the industry um, and, and some of them are coming back, but the concern is that not all of them. The other concern is that there's, it's an aging uh, skill base as well. Mm. Uh, and the concern is that if, if uh, you know, a, an older uh, you know, uh, leader of a, a group of bricklayers, gang of bricklayers, uh, if he doesn't come back, mm. also the, the young guys that he had, working with him don't come back yeah. and, and they were kind of future um, you know, kind of managers that were going to have gangs underneath them as well um, so there is serious concern on that you know it, it's you, you see it in in the labor rates so because there's, there's a shortage um, you know the, the competition for that labor is fierce um, and it, it gets costly sourcing that labor for ourselves as opposed to our competition and that's kind of you know one of the areas that we haven't really had to compete with our yeah, our competitors in the last you know few years, but we have to we compete for labour now. So there's maybe something that we, we could work on on uh, ensuring um, better uh, knowledge transfer in in skills. Uh, I just want to get to the end of this little um, build a house journey. Um, so eventually we managed to find some good skills um, and adequate labour on site, and we built our home. Um, how do we engage with our uh, buyers that eventually become our community right now? I, I would say th this, is where, um, this is where we are a bit more tech technologically astute, right. astute, if that's the right word. Um, and, and so we do have you know, good use of, uh, you know, we've got some great websites uh, that we use to engage, uh, social media, um, we do look to kind of you know, get the communication out there. But then we do have you know, the, the trial and trusted 
uh, methods again of kind of you know of hoardings flags show homes people drive past you know and, and that's kind of how we've looked to kind of you know get people in um, and then and then once they're once they're they're in you know we look to kind of you know impress them with the quality of our build the design of our build the spaces that we can give them um, and, and, and trying to track them that way but it becomes harder once a transaction has been complete um, to maintain um, an ongoing relationship um, you know with your buyers you know they become the owners they quite rightly want to kind of protect their privacy yeah. um, and it becomes harder to know more about the way they use the asset that you provided. Um, so maybe that, that's something that could be improved in creating a, a longer um, relationship that might be beneficial for both parties. Um, on, on that note, I will hold it there. Um, so we kind of we started from land, we went into planning, uh, through the risk of planning, um, into the risk of construction, and eventually in the opportunity for better engagement with um, with your customers, really, your communities. Um, I would like hold it there for a second um, and start talking about open data. And mm -hmm. as, as I was mentioning earlier, the purpose of this project, uh, funded by the BRE Trust, is to increase the level of lit literacy around open data. Mm -hmm. In other words, talk about it. In other words, um, explain what the opportunity is mm. and I think the first fundamental step is to ask someone like Ben who knows about this what is open data? Well it's an excellent question and one which is all too often not well understood. Um, we start with the premise that open data is any information maintained by any source that could be government, it could be industry, uh, it could be third sector or just a concerned individual um, which is made freely available and accessible to the public at large uh, to use uh, and reuse as they see fit. So at its most simple, this is any kind of information, whether textual or numbers or facts and figures, that is made open and accessible to the public at large. Um, open data has become the subject of a number of different interpretations uh, based on industry, based on where you stand in the process. Um, and sometimes these can cloud the waters of what we understand by open data. But at its fundamental level, just any information freely available to the general public to use. And do we need the government to give us the data or can we find that um, open data elsewhere? Uh, this is another common um, misconception, which is that open data comes solely from government. Uh, now, what has been the case in the past is that open data from government has the strongest reason to be released, i.e. we pay our taxes, so give us the data we paid for, which has meant that government, particularly central government, has taken a lead in releasing open data. Uh, but in recent years, we've seen that industry and the third sector are also coming on board. They're realising that their data has a fundamental value and a power which can only be unlocked by opening it up to the general public and to public view. Fantastic. Okay, so we, so we know that the construction industry is collecting quite a bit of data, mm -hmm. um, and we you know working together to understand what we could do with it. Mm. Um, I think part of the issue is not knowing what the p opportunities are, um, and there is somehow um, a risk of being held back by the level of IT skills required to understand um, open data. Now I know Citadel on the move um, has done some great work on standardizing um, uh, the format of open data and also created templates for uh, apps mm -hmm. um, to be developed in a, in a, you know, by anyone almost. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a very interesting story to, to share. What is Citadel on the Move? Well, Citadel on the Move was established, uh, it's a European Commission-backed project um, started by a number of interested parties in different countries across uh, Europe, uh, which is designed to make open data a simple and fundamentally accessible reality um, for governments, businesses and indeed citizens across Europe. So we start with the premise that open data can no longer be the sole preserve of technically minded uh, IT skilled people. It needs to be out there in the general domain, accessible to all so that its benefits can be widely realised. So we start from three basic premises. Number one, open data needs to be fully understood. Number two, it needs to be simple to open and put out there. And number three, it needs to be useful. Now we went about this by firstly standardizing the formats for open data because 
there's no way to do something widely until you understand how it should be done. And a good example of that would be the Building Information Management Task Force. I think many of you viewers may recognize the work that that's done in the UK over the past years in standardizing the way the construction industry collects and um, shares data between the different parties in the supply chain. And doing the same thing for open data, ensuring that there's a standard approach which you can give to anyone and they can follow, is very important to breaking down the barriers to use. And the other side of that is ensuring that the data is well used once it's open. Uh, a spreadsheet somewhere on a website uh, is not going to float the boats of most ordinary people. It's not going to get very much use because that's not the way we understand the world. We understand it through our smartphones, through our computers, through our TVs. So it's about making data useful. And for that, we built a simple application generator and a series of template applications which take any open data set in the Citadel format um, and instantly turn it into a mapping app that you can use, that you can see, that you can begin to explore and play with. And I understand, is that easier that even a child could do it? In fact, we, uh, we ran a competition for Citadel on the move uh, back in 2014, the early part thereof. Um, in which we challenged developers from around the world uh, to build applications using Citadel, uh, which had data on more than two continents. Now, our competition was won by two great kids, eight and nine years old, um, from the west coast of the United States, who uh, built an application called At Me On The Move, which used data from the US, from Europe, and from South Africa to create an app that worked in three continents. They did this in probably a couple of hours all told, from starting to think about their application to having the finished product ready to go. And the fact that this system is so simple that even children can begin to experiment and play and explore this open data is a really powerful message to industry, to government, that they need to think about how it's being reused and make it welcoming, get people into the process. I think that's a fantastic story to start our, you know, brainstorming session um, and just for my own clarity um, data mapping seems to be the easiest uh, door in, into uh, open data mm -hmm. so I have um, a different um, amount of variety of diversity of data mm -hmm. um, I can uh, mash them all up onto a GIS on a, onto, onto a map mm -hmm. really um, and with that I can just make it clear for everyone to understand what's out there and I think starting from what's out there could be a, a, a valuable um, you know, starting point for, to, for helping um, the housing industry. Absolutely. I mean, we found that mapping is, is something which is fundamental and universal. And particularly when we come to talk about the construction industry, people understand the construction industry and the built environment in terms of the space around them. So a map is a natural starting point for collecting what is often quite diverse and different data and putting it onto a single playing field. Um, so using maps, it's possible to get a whole range of information about the local area out there to citizens and to begin a conversation with them about how a construction project is going to affect their local area. Great example of this um, from someone we've engaged with a lot in the Citadel project, which is Sedgemoor Council down in Somerset. Now, the council down there is building a large nuclear power station, um, which is having some profound impacts on the local community in terms of people, in terms of noise, in terms of um, what the environment will look like. And Sedgemoor took the step of opening up all that data on a map for local residents so that they can begin to understand how exactly the nuclear power station project is going to affect their local area. And the, the results were that it demystified it for people. People were no longer confused. They were no longer having to sit on the phone for hours simply to find out information about how their local road was affected, for example, or how many new people were going to be in the town. They could get all that information quickly and easily. And um, Paul Davidson, um, one of our associates down there in Sedgemoor, has told us that it made the process immensely easier, both for the council and for local residents, um, to, to get this through and to build a shared understanding around that data. That's a fantastic story and, and we start to uh, experience and notice that when large developers start to um, act on the city um, and, and push urban regeneration particularly forward, um, the notion of social value has gained so much traction and relevance 
that even the private sector you know, starts to kind of think as a public um, entity almost. So, so the overall uh, quality of the urban environment is not only um, a result um, from the kind of public uh, agenda, so what the council is doing about it, uh, but it is also uh, as a result, it, it comes as a result um, of the private developer interest. You know, if a city, as part of the city, is working well, uh, you know, the value of land will go up. And, and you know, it will be a more thriving community and, and things will be cheaper um, and, and more valuable. So what I will try to kind of, you know, start now um, is to go back to that, you know, sequence um, of, of, of steps um, in supplying housing and see how, you know, if we had a very bright um, uh, US West Coast uh, child with us today, what would he do um, if he could uh, have access to Barrett's data sets? So we, we started from uh, mentioning the diversity and um, intricacies in finding land across the UK. Uh, we have better mapping uh, from some parts of the UK um, and potentially uh, untapped um, you know, pockets of, of growth elsewhere. And, and, and the problem sometimes is that we don't know about it. You know, we don't know that actually there is a fantastic new transport link uh, which the, the, the public sector has been paying for uh, that could unlock this uh, new connection back in town. Um, so w what could we do? What, what, what sort of uh, data set could we play with um, in improving the land market and improving the way we uh, find opportunity for housing development? And you know, th this is not being prepared, is, is really uh, as a result of our collective um, thinking. <laughs> We're all ears, Ben. Okay. We're, how can you help us? How can you help us find land? Well, I would say that there's uh, there's a couple of um, areas in which the 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 open data agenda has the potential to help power the search for land. Uh, the first is around just who's out there, who wants to live in a local area, and what kind of housing demand are they after. So it may be that when you've identified a parcel of land, something which you think maybe this could be good for building, um, you have the opportunity to find out what does the local area look like in terms of people? What are their wants and needs? Um, it may be that your local area contains a lot of young people who are potential first-time buyers, would be looking maybe for smaller units um, in larger volume, something which they can get into at an affordable price. Or it may be that you have a more affluent area, um, people looking perhaps to upsize, growing families. And just having that information uh, gives you a great deal more quality on your land data. Um, the other side of that is around starting a conversation with the community through data. So it's about going out there to communities um, using open data to say, well, listen, we were thinking about this piece of land. How would you feel about a development? Because often you can get quite valuable insights from people on the grounds, the people who, as you say, like your sales managers, know the area really well. And they can, they can provide you with additional information that lets you make more informed choices about where to look for land, what kind of land, and how it should be developed. I think that the, the opportunity behind this you know, uh, early start um, in the local community engagement is not only to have your market research refined, um, but also to create the community before the community. So start creating a sense of ownership of the future housing estates, even before that um, gets under the way. And I think that you know, we all rely on fantastically accurate consultancy work, mm, but actually knowing from the source and also establishing an ongoing relationship, an ongoing dialogue mm. could be uh, you know, really you know, bridging the gap between uh, forecast um, and reality. Mm. Yeah. I, mean, I, I, I could definitely see the value in, in kind of what, what you're saying there. I mean, kind of uh, our our sales website will capture a lot, a lot of data. You know wh what people are inquiring, what are they after, mm. and obviously, and where are they from when they're doing that. Mm. So I'm wondering if that's kind of a potential avenue that might kind of be a, a, a start to that conversation. Was well, absolutely, you know, uh, th this kind of data, which is immensely valuable. Um, some of it um, needs to be protected for privacy reasons, but uh, if it was anonymized, if it was generalized. Mm. There's information there which you can put out there to the public, to developers, and which you can get back really sort of added value results uh, for your industry that make life easier for you. 
So it may be that an interested person, maybe a developer, maybe someone in the local community um, has a look and says, we can see that people in this part of the country are desperate for this sort of housing unit. Mm -hmm. It just gives Barrett the, the sort of the extra information it needs to go away and think about new options, new choices um, for identifying land and for, for then using that land to it, its maximum impact. And once you have the data, once you have that um, you know, real-time um, result for this kind of market testing, which you know, sounds not that nice if you call it market testing, really, you know, is the result of this conversation, which is ongoing. You can then use the result of that ongoing dialogue and start possibly a different conversation with your planning mm -hmm. partner, because you, you suddenly are um, the interpreter um, of a collective desire. You're not only trying to, of course, you're, you know, you're making your profit, but you come from a shared process that has already created a community behind it. Um, so that, I think, moving from land to planning, there could be uh, another interesting um, you know, place to start in, in using open data um, for housing developments. What, what do you think about this? I, I know that and, and the thing kind of, you know, it, it's a... Um it's a, a concern of the business, you know, the, 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 pro the planning process and the risk involved with that um, and anything that can kind of, you know, help facilitate that, uh, you know, reduce the risk, uh, add kind of credence to the, you know, the, the planning application is something that we'd be interested in. Mm. And I mean, one of, one of the areas where open data and the conversation you can start around data can really help here um, is, is engaging with the community about prospective planning applications before they happen. You know, if, you, if you're able to start a conversation with the local community and they say, actually, you know, this parcel of land, we'd love some houses to be built there. And this one, maybe we're more split on, or it needs this kind of development. Then when you come to the application stage, you've got that extra level of weight to go to the planning authorities with to say, hey, people in the local community are telling us we really want this kind of housing. Yeah. Isn't that a good reason why we should streamline this process, get it through faster, um, and and you know make the best choices that sort of match the demands of the local community? That could be definitely something interesting mm. to, to do. And then once you collect all these pockets um, of evidence, you can actually start building a nationwide map mm. um, of people desires and actually realize that you know what you supply is you're supplying is quite good but it could just be you know, implemented significantly by matching the um, profile um, of the demand out there. So that's kind of interesting, and then there's definitely something that can be done there. Um, the next one up, which is the big topic, you know, everyone is talking about this in the construction industry, is the skill shortage. You know, you know, I mean, government and industry shared um, construction um, industry uh, strategy report um, issued last year, um, you know, makes it very clear, you know, no, w we, have an aging workforce, we don't have the required replacement, um, and our mo modern method of construction um, are not quite developed enough uh, to fill that gap. Mm. Um, so uh, I'm very, very interested now in how open data could help take the best of knowledge we already have and make sure it doesn't get lost. Mm. <laughs> Start with the expert. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, I, I agree, Antonio, I, I agree completely with what you're saying. You know, we, we, we've had the discussion around, yeah, um, there, there is concern over, over how we're going to build the houses. Um, you know, my uh, open data knowledge is, is obviously is, is nothing compared to Ben's. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think, you know, from this, this uh, you know, uh, starter position. Um, you know, we do some partnership work with kind of colleges uh, that, mm. you know, that are, are looking to kind of, you know, to bring, you know, new people into the into the system and, and I assume that they'd have data that would be of, of value to us mm. um, in, in terms of identifying you know, where these people are that are bringing these new new skills through and is that something that we would then need to think about or, or could think about in terms of where we identify as kind of growth areas yeah absolutely I mean and this has really sparked my imagination because it, obviously the skill shortage is an area that I've heard of but don't know nearly as well as either of you. But just you know, speaking from a data perspective, one of the um, examples, uh, really powerful examples of open data is understanding um, where people are with certain skills. Now, 
wouldn't it be a great start if the construction industry together with government and people themselves could find out where the skills live you were talking earlier about you know the holy grail that older very skilled worker who has knowledge in his head which is going to be incredibly valuable essential for the next generation and maybe there are six or seven of those down in a certain area of the country and absolutely none in another area wouldn't it be great then to be able to identify them to reach out to them to say we would we would love one or two of you to come to this part of the country for a project to pass on those skills to capture those skills and here we move away from our traditional conception of open data as just sort of numbers on a page towards more qualitative stuff it could be short videos um, just you know techniques preserving that that sort of knowledge um, and making sure that the next generation which is now being trained up and is, is going to come in and have to sort of um, to, to fill that gap has the the skills and the knowledge that do doesn't mean you're starting from scratch so open data can really help with finding out where these people are and what they know yeah and I think moving um, away from the competitive market issues of, of releasing you know uh, private and sensitive data um, and start engaging with people mm. and understanding what people can do and what can't do um, it, it's a fantastic engine for for you know better integration and collaboration and and regardless you know which uh, builder you work for uh, I'm very interested in what you've done you know how many buildings how many techniques um, what you what you passionate about what you you know we really can't stand doing and maybe there is a reason why you can't stand doing uh, that particular job because maybe it's not the best way of doing it mm -hmm. so engaging with the workforce um, and and you know find a way to talk to the entire UK construction workforce at once mm. through a clever use of open data uh, could be a fantastic source um, for, for um, change. And definitely, and this, this speaks to a really important point about open data, which is that there's a perception that you need to protect data, uh, that data is like gold or oil, that once you, once you let it out there, it's gone. Someone else has got the value. Um, but data doesn't work like that, releasing it in no way harms its value to you because you still have the access to it. What it does is it potentially creates additional value for you or for the industry as a whole. By sharing that information across different, um, you know, different providers of construction or through the supply chain, it's possible to build greater value for the industry in terms of where the skills are and, and making sure they're properly met than you would ever have if everyone held on to their own data. Um, and, and with no detriment. So, you know, all it really takes is for one or two uh, companies to take the lead, to recognize the economic benefit that's out there. Um, and also to rephrase the argument around open data away from just a social good. It is a social good. It absolutely has immense social power, but it's also an economic benefit for the, the person who's releasing it. So getting that data out there is not just a, a selfless action, it's not corporate social responsibility, it's also a, a competitive advantage. Getting people using your data, having a conversation around your information is a, a commercial benefit. And I understand that you know, th there is a, a first step um, which is almost um, a brainstorming level you know there's, there's an interesting um, research I suppose uh, to be done by simply mapping mm. um, things out there um, and then through the process of understanding what data is available mm. you know the idea may come so if, if we could map skills in the UK construction sector and have a very simple you know accessible mashup of who is where we will be starting, you know, realizing that there is a shortage or there is an abundance of a specific skill, mm. or maybe there is not enough understanding or a specific technique. And I think that would be a, an interesting starting point. I think there is there is a shared um, interest in improving the output and the outcome of the industry. So each developer, each builder, should in their own interest, in their own commercial interest, mm. um, releasing the data related to their skills. Yeah, uh, I, I can see, uh, as you're talking now, I'm thinking, you know, I can see a huge benefit for the supply chain as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it might influence kind of, you know, where they look to set up operations based on where the, where the skill base is. Yeah. 
which would then obviously have a kind of secondary benefit through to us because they would have you know be delivering better products quicker cheaper so down the chain as well i can see benefit absolutely definitely and this you know a good example of this from citadel from government um is business rates data right now the government holds data on how much you have to charge um in business rates um, and up until recently, this was all held very closely because it, w it was considered valuable, something you should protect. Um, but our clients in Leeds realized that they were actually getting their most freedom of information requests were coming on this business rates data set because lawyers working on behalf of companies in the city always querying the business rates, which meant they had to spend staff time and money. Now, by opening up this data set, they cut freedom of information requests by around 4% in a single year, which is a big saving when you think that a single request can cost sometimes upwards of 5,000 pounds to service. Um, so what may have appeared a short-term benefit to the government of holding on to this data actually turned into a long-term benefit of releasing it. And the same is true in the construction industry with information about skills. If you can build up information about skills, you, you start, you know, driving the skills market, you know, disseminating those really valuable techniques that make the, the, those gang leaders so valuable to the industry. And in, you know, maybe two or three or five years, you're going to see more people with those skills, which means more affordable labor and more affordable houses, ultimately, which is economic benefit to the provider. And starting by celebrating people, you know, through open data uh, is also a first tangible step towards, you know, in filling the skills gap. So you know, if, if um, somebody um, still uncertain about um, joining or not the construction industry um, could learn from a very successful story uh, of someone being on site for 40 years and just knowing everything about their specific uh, trade, um, could be a very inspiring, uh, you know, piece of, piece of information to share. Um, I suppose the, um, the example uh, of opening up, opening up um, data related to um, uh, business rates um, is quite, quite useful for us to talk uh, about another fundamental um, keyword um, in the open data discussion, which mm -hmm. is transparency. Mm -hmm. And I think with transparency, I would like to tackle the fourth chapter of our housing uh, mini guide, which is engagement with community. Um, you know, there is a lot of misconception about you know what a developer does, you know, and how much you know again you know, gain from from their operations. Um, but you know, I, I'm an architect and I work with developers, um, and sometimes you know you surprise yourself by seeing how you know sensible everything is. This is the cost of land, mm. which in the UK is fantastic. is uh, is incredibly uh, high compared to other um, you know places in the EU zones, um, and and everything kind of makes sense. So that you know, we could break barriers by being more transparent, mm. because at the end of the day, we all follow uh, rules of the market to a certain extent. And the more we, we enable transparency to improve our communication, mm. um, the easier it will be for business to grow. So, so uh, you know, could you see a, a potential for uh, talking to your community, talking to your customer, uh, engaging in a more transparent um, and, and uh, ongoing way? I, I think. Um I think we consider ourselves a, 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 a transparent organisation, you know, as, as it stands. You know, your, your example there on land value is, you know, when, whenever we're in kind of discussions with landowners, with you know, local authorities, it's all open book. You know, we're completely honest with the numbers, um, you know, and, and which ultimately feeds into what that land value is. Um, in terms of kind of, you know, when it comes to, to uh, communities, I mean, I think, as, as you say, kind of, there is... A, there is a bit of a misconception around you know what developers do and then their motives and and, mm. and and that sort of things but you know it, it's our, it's our genuine intention to kind of to you know and to enhance communities and, and to the sites that we do bring to the table to to deliver well-designed great places you know the, the, the term great places um, we, we use a, a metric called building for life uh, which is an assessment of design quality which we you know um, like to uh, which we, we, we uh, aspire to on every site that we build so transparency with the community would, would never be a problem for us. Um, you know, by them understanding, you know, what we're about to a greater extent, I can only see mm. benefit um, in, in doing so. Mm. And yeah, that's, and this, this comes back to the idea of starting a conversation around data 
you know, if you could you know, somehow better communicate through open data the the sort of the percent the how you go about acquiring land, the fact that you you're providing a social good with this housing, that this is something that people really need in this area and that, you know, you're you're really providing a, a good for that local community. That goes a long way, I think, to, to changing perceptions of, of developers and, and the construction industry in the local community. And likewise, getting their views on how they see a development, how they see the future of their local area, um, gives, gives you a sort of a, a valuable way to be open and to communicate the right messages, you know, the things that, that really connect with local people and, and make the process uh, simpler, easier and more transparent. I think, the, you know, in a nutshell, you know, one way I would try to summarise the opportunity for the construction industry is to realise that we not only produce good, but we also produce public good. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in this, you know, uh, simple slogan, we can actually harness quite a bit of what we discussed. If the construction industry, UK-wide, understands the relevance uh, of a social uh, value uh, policy, then, then we all kind of, yes, we do agree. We all want to work towards that change. Mm. Um, so uh, enabling better transparency, uh, better communication with communities, um, you know, has commercial value for a housing developer. You know, uh, understanding uh, how energy is used um, in a community um, actually has potential value uh, for the customer which therefore wants to um, engage with spe specific developer able to uh, communicate that part of data. Um, you know, enabling a better and transparent monitoring of crime or happiness. Uh, they do all build the social value that eventually we want to create. And they drive something which I think is quite important for open data, um, which is, well, we call it citizen centricity or being focused on the person. Um, and in the construction industry, the more information you can gather, the more you can make projects focused on ultimately the people who are going to buy and live in those homes. The more you know about them, their local area, the easier it is to, uh, to, to construct projects which, which match their needs and which make for happier, you know, better developments and, and also drive your commercial benefit in the future. I love the, I love the idea of that. <laughs> Yeah, happiness indices of every one of our customers, you know, and, and, and you know, looking to map that and see, you know, mm. you know where, where, where it's high, what are the reasons why it's high, where it's maybe not quite so high, what's going on, because obviously we, we do use these, these metrics, like I say, building for life. Um, but yeah, the happiness, the happiness index of our mm. customers, we're on board. And also, you know, that might be something as simple as getting your customers to engage with you over a longer time frame once they've bought the house about how they feel living in the house. About So you know that a house is making someone feel particularly good when they're in these kind of rooms or you know, great when they're walking around this aspect of the outside. Just getting people to give you that kind of feedback which becomes open data gives everyone a better idea of how to build houses that make people happy, which is ultimately the way to sell more houses. So, so. So, you know, talking to a, a large, established uh, UK housing uh, developer, um, the question is, is there an opportunity for open data to, to improve um, our work? I, I, I think there is. I think I've, this has been a learning experience for me. So I, so I, I thank you both Same. for that. Um, I, I, I can see value in it uh, 100% on, 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 all the, on all the streams that we've kind of discussed. Um, I think yeah, that the happiness in the happiness index is going to stay with me. Uh, that's one I'm going to I want to take away and have a think about. But um, but you know that like the, the point around planning, as I say, that that is a kind of you know it can be a real crux for us. Uh, you know it's there is a such a level of risk involved in in taking sites through the planning process, uh, and anything that can kind of assist with that is is really worthwhile in my opinion. Fantastic. So hopefully a conversation has started today. Um, and you know it should continue. Yeah, absolutely, definitely. Well, Stephen, Ben, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.